Welcome to REST, which stands for Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. I'm your host, Susan Gans, and this show is about hearing from leaders of small, mid-sized businesses, heads of nonprofits, and other community leaders about their professional journeys, how they are being resilient and empowering others during these challenging times. I'm so happy to have today Michalina DeCibio. She's also known finally as Mick amongst her friends and family. She is a certified holistic health coach and a health and lifestyle entrepreneur, author, educator, and owner of a wellness franchise. Her inspirational story of transformation was published in May 2019 in the number one bestseller, The Art of Unlearning, personal stories on the courage to step out of your comfort zone. And we'll get into that later. For 25 years, Michalina served in various leadership roles in the IT financing industry, beginning at IBM. Before ditching her nine to five job to pursue her life's passion to help others achieve better health and prosperity. She is an active member of her local parish, St. Rose of Lima in Newtown and Walking with Purpose, a Bible study for women. She is a founding member of VNO and leader in the Ivy Life community, which is how we met, where she has spoken and talk, taught on many topics. She serves on their personal board of directors and is often, call, often called upon for her advice and counsel. Mick earned her BS in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, which we also share that in common, although I did that <laughs> for my graduate degree. Um, she is a graduate from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and is board certified by the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. In her spare time, as if she's not busy enough, she enjoys cooking, exercising, and reading, and anything related to personal growth. Most of all, and most importantly, she loves sp spending time with her family, her friends, and watching her two kids play collegiate sports. So welcome to Rust. Thank I'm you, so Susan. happy to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Appreciate the invitation. My pleasure. So take us back in time a little bit, Mick, and tell us about those early days in your career, because you had a whole other career with financial technology, and now you're doing something different. So tell us about that journey. Yeah, sure. So thank you again for inviting me, Susan. I really appreciate the opportunity to share. So for me, I started out in the IT financing industry about 10 years ago. I was getting really run down from sort of what I call that hamster wheel, you know, getting up early in the morning, yes. working all day. You can relate to this, right? Working very long hours and then getting up the next day and doing it all over again. What happened with me was it really began to take a toll on my health, which in turn affected everybody around me. So I knew a change needed to be made. Also taking into consideration my family background, my father passed away when I was a little girl. So health concerns were always something that were sort of in the back of my mind. And I wanted to be sure that I was doing all of the right things so that I could avoid some of the pitfalls that I experienced with my parents growing up. So I got to a point in my career where I was diagnosed with something called osteopenia. It's a bone condition. It's the precursor to osteoporosis. And that was sort of like the red flashing light that said, okay, stop. We need to just take a look at what we're doing here and reevaluate priorities and so on. I began to get really very well educated into the world of nutrition. I saw an amazing functional medicine doctor who opened my eyes to the world of holistic care. And I really began to realize that I needed to make changes sooner than later. Because again, I didn't want to, I was thinking of all these things that were happening to me as a child with around the, my dad's, losing my dad and, and things my mother faced as we were growing up. So I decided to throw myself into this. I participated in the IIN program. I became certified as a holistic health practitioner, holistic health coach. I started working with people part-time to teach them 
the things that I had learned, not just from the schooling, but also from my own personal yes. experience. And I loved it. I loved that I was able to help people in a way that I couldn't do behind a computer at my desk working a deal. It just wasn't giving me the same level of satisfaction, fulfillment. So I knew in my heart, Susan, that this was going to be in my future, that there was going to, this was planting a seed, literally no pun, no pun intended, because now I work with planting seeds. Yes, you can tell you behind see me. your garden. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, it lights me up. It's all come full circle. I'm in the place I'm supposed to be. So I started working with people part-time. It became, it started to grow and grow and grow. And so I have since left the corporate, the traditional corporate environment. I'm now in a wellness franchise that is in 26 or so countries around the world. I work as an independent educator and I help other healthcare professionals and others who are looking for a way to help people stay out of the sick care system. That's really my main goal is to teach people how to take control of their health to stay out of the sick care system. And in today's lingo, we hear so much about underlying conditions. Well, we know from the data that things like heart disease, diabetes, so on, inflammation, immune deficiencies, et cetera, many of those things can be either avoided or aided by proper diet and lifestyle. I think the, the stat is somewhere between 75 and 80% of chronic illnesses can be, you know, either healed or, or prevented. And I take this from Dr. David Katz, who is at Yale, I believe. Um, so anyway, so that's sort of how it all started for me was that initial diagnosis. I started to have my own experience. I got educated. I loved passing it on to other people so much so that now it's become my full-time career, if you want to call it that. I don't feel like it's work though, because I love it so much. It's just part of my life. And we all see that and just the way that you did light up as, as soon as you talked about your shift. Um, right. And you'll notice that when, when mm -hmm. you see this, this back. And I really honor you for making that change because sometimes people get signals mm -hmm. about their health and then sometimes they ignore it. Right. And sometimes they... Um, you know, they, they say, Oh, I'll, I'll get to it later. Yes. I notice it and I'll get to it later. Or it, it, they have to wait until they're hospitalized for some reason right. in order to address it. So I like that you have done that. Um, I want to uh, address the self care and just share with our audience what you do now relative to self care based on the education that you received. Um, just give us a peek into your routines and rituals. Right. Well, that's a great question. And if I, if I may, I just want to touch on, you made a really important point just a moment ago with regard to people waiting to get to this point where they're in dire need. What we know is that inflammation is the foundation to all dis-ease. Inflammation exists. In my case, and in many cases, it's silent at first. So in the context of osteopenia, I didn't know that I had weak bones until I had an, an incident where I, I fractured my leg ah. from running. And that's how I knew I had this condition. Think about things like cancer. Oftentimes cancer is growing slowly over time. You don't even feel what's going on. So by the time you get to the scenario you describe where someone is going to the hospital because they're, or they're feeling very sick, your body's screaming for help. So I want to help people get ahead of that. You know, let's do what we can now to address the silent part so that we don't get to the part where we're desperate for yes. help. In terms of the self-care, I think what's really important, what I encourage my followers and my community to do is to treat self-care just as you would a doctor's appointment an important meeting with your best client, because guess what? You are your best client. You should be thinking of yourself as the most important person that you serve. So when you think about self-care in that context, what I encourage people to do is literally schedule it like you would as if you were going 
to a really important meeting. For me now, that time is early in the morning. So I've become more disciplined about getting the proper sleep, planning an extra or an hour earlier in my day where the house is quiet. I can do my prayers, my meditation, my yoga or something aerobic. I tend to alternate and play with different things. But the point is that you're treating this time with yourself as a meeting. In my old world, my life revolved around meetings. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> now I'm scheduling meetings with me. How exciting <laughs> right? is that? How exciting is that? You don't have to get dressed up for it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you can do Slow the meeting. Slow maintenance. <laughs> you can have the meeting. You can have the meeting in your pajamas if you want. It doesn't matter because you're just, nobody's watching. It's just, you're taking care of yourself. Right. So that's priority number one is schedule the meeting with you to take care of you because the more you take care of you, you can then serve others better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Better. Absolutely. I love what you said that each of us are our own best clients yes. and it's, it's, bears repeating because I think we often forget that, especially yes. um, women, because we, we find ourselves playing many different roles at any one given mm -hmm. time. So thank you for that gift of you're your own best client. That's right. I want to also pick up on something you've uh, said a few times now about this core value around teaching and making an mm -hmm. impact. So can you share what you like most about that, about the teaching and the educating? Well, the teaching for me is so gratifying because I feel like I have a personal responsibility to take what I've learned and pay it forward. So when I can do that in a way that instills change or inspiration in another person, that to me is the greatest reward I could get for my work is to know that I have improved hopefully somebody's life in some positive way. So whether it's teaching something about wellness, which is now my area of expertise, or it's teaching about LinkedIn or whatever the topic, <laughs> whatever the topic may be, cooking or other things, it just makes me so happy when I know that it has made somebody else's day a little better. And I feel very strongly about this idea of having a positive attitude, positive energy. It really is contagious, Susan, it is. And so if I can pass a little bit of that on to someone else and it just keeps going, can you imagine a world where we all just had a little bit more of that? You know, what could happen? It's pretty incredible. Yes, I, I agree with you. The ripple effects of positivity, I mean, to see what's um, happening in our New York metropolitan area at seven o'clock at night where, you know, it was a grassroots effort with people clapping and playing music and banging on pots and things like that. And that's like grown into a movement and that sort of positivity radiating out so yeah. and what a beautiful it, thing when you say you know what you're the point that you're on i think or what i'm triggered to think about yeah. is the idea that out of negativity out of this pandemic yes. that we are in the middle of there is always something good that can come from something really bad yes that's for me having living in a state of appreciation and gratitude is just it's amazing what can come of that you know and sometimes unfortunately it takes really bad situations for that to come out but just look at what's happening now it's creating this ripple effect yes yeah. absolutely i also want to go back to something you said about um paying it forward and um getting that uh gratification from from teaching i'm curious to know who have been your mentors and sponsors along the way and have they changed at different points of your career because you've done so many different things? Right. Well, so first and foremost, and not to get too spiritual on you, but I'm going to say God because faith was always a very big part of my life. 
in terms of others, because I've, I've had to lean on my faith in many scenarios, you know, as a child throughout and other things that have happened in life that have been difficult to face. So faith for me has been a really big part of my life. There have been so many other mentors. I mean, I can think of my high school guidance counselor who directed me to Penn, for example. I can think of wonderful, amazing leaders that I met at IBM and leaders that I met at the company I left before I came into my own wellness business and mentors that I have now. But I, so I don't want to leave anybody out. So I'm going to say they were yes. all amazing. <laughs> but I will mention a couple of the other more well-known influencers, people like Bob Proctor, for example, has a wonderful program called Thinking Into Results for anyone who's interested in mind work, working through mindset and really working through paradigms, which are so important to know what those paradigms are. What are the blocks that you have that are preventing you from getting to the next level in your journey? And leads a little bit into empowerment, which I know is, um, is something we're all interested in. So, you know, Bob Proctor, I have read wonderful books by Gabrielle Bernstein. I think she's amazing. She's got a new book now called Super Attractor. She has The Universe Has Your Back, The Judgment Detox. These are all books that really talk about, again, I think the foundation to any level of success is having the right mindset. So they have been very a very big part of my uh, personal growth journey and influencing the way that I think about life. And let's talk about the empowerment point. How do you empower yourself? And then how do you empower others? Right? Well, for me, empowerment is about building confidence. So that when you are conveying an idea to someone, they see the belief that you have, in what it is and having belief in something, and feeling really confident in, in what it is that you're sharing or teaching or speaking about is very empowering. And I think we all need to find that place where we feel uh, we have a strong belief in something, we have a gift, and to use your words, that you want to share with other people. To me, that's really empowering. So the way I sort of practice it is I use daily affirmations to reinforce my beliefs. And they, these are some of these anyone can use. I am, I am brave. I am courageous. I am worthy, so on and so forth, right? These are true. These are things that we want everyone to feel about themselves because everyone has the potential to, um, to really do things that they don't, may not think they can do today. There's so much more potential in all of us beyond what even the human eye can see. I believe this is my, my belief. Absolutely. Um, it's really, you know, to me, especially during this time, it's, people getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and pushing mm -hmm. themselves to learn new things and being more open-minded, having more of a growth mindset than that fixed yeah. mindset that we might've gotten very comfortable with and how things were done in the past. Right. So totally appreciate that. Which brings me to my next question, which is really about resiliency mm. um, because it seems like different parts of your life, you've been very resilient. So can you share with us your resiliency journey? Yeah, so resiliency is a big one. I think we all, this is a skill that we all um, want to practice, I believe, because we're going to face ups and downs in life. And for me, resiliency means that it's the bouncing back. It's when the chips are down, what, how are we going to react? How are we going to come back? So what I've learned is that we, we know this, some really awful things have happened and will happen. And I have sort of retrained myself to not ask why, because for many things, we may not get an answer to why. Why has this happened? And we can get lost in that. And I know in the past, I have at times gotten lost in why, why has this happened? Why, why, why? But I think the better answer is what can I learn from this? What can I take from this? What am I supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to do with what has happened? 
And I think that when we look at a difficult situation in that way, if we really get quiet with ourselves and we think there is some other message that usually comes through that will guide us to the next step. So there are many things, you know, incidents I can think of where this has happened in, um, in my life. And I think that every time I've been able to just take a step back and think, hey, what am I going to do with this? It has either led it, well, it has mostly led to a new opportunity to help more people because you take the lesson of what you've learned and now you're helping next person get through their next situation and helping them to build resiliency. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. And a point I want to pick up on is, you know, you, you said there's, there's another message, right? What, what can you learn from a particularly challenging situation. So my question is, is there a word or a phrase that you find inspiring that you would like others to remember? Mm. So there are many. I'm going to say what you think about, you bring about. What you, think about, what you think about, you bring about. And I do believe that whatever you focus on will grow. And I'll, I'll use this too, this phrase that I've seen, your mind is like a garden and your thoughts are the seeds. You I love grow, that. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. Yes. <laughs> so we have a choice. Every yes. single day when we get up, do we want to grow flowers or do we want to grow weeds? And how are we going to react to what's happening around us, our circumstances? And it goes without saying, we're all facing challenges. Absolutely. Everybody is in their own. And I've learned pain comes in so many different you know, forms, and fa forms and fashion, et cetera. But it's up to us to control, to some degree, our thoughts. Reach out. Reach out for help. When you're having a moment, and it's a difficult moment, reach out for help. Like, don't be ashamed to ask for help we're all in this together and we're all going to pull out of it together. But we need to remember that we're all at the end of the day, I believe that we're more alike than we are different. If we get to the core yes. of who we all are as human beings. So if we fo focus on that, you know, focus on the good and more good will come. And I like how you focus on it's okay to ask. Mm -hmm. this it's hard sometimes for people to give themselves permission to ask. So to, to hear it um, said out loud, um, it's great that our audience can know. It's okay to ask for help. No judgments, right. just ask. Um, last couple of questions before we wrap up. What is at least one takeaway or insight that you would like our audience to take away from our conversation today? I would say, Susan, to think about the fact that transformation can happen for anybody. Your only limit is you. It's whatever, it goes back to your thoughts. So people may be watching this for inspiration, perhaps they're looking for ways they can become more resilient, or maybe they're not sure, they're just curious, right? Looking yes. for just ideas. I would say, you know, brainstorm, write down, make a list of things that you really would love to achieve in your life. And don't place any limits on it. I mean, for me personally, when I made the, the transition from working in my IT career, and then coming into the wellness, I grant you, it's scary. It's really scary. And you could sort of, you know, curl back and say, oh, this is never going to work. You know, you could tell yourself a hundred reasons for why you can't do something. But what I encourage you to do is don't place any limits on where you can go. Because taking one small step at a time, it could be just reaching out to one person and having one conversation or 
sending an email or sending a text message inquiring about this area that you're really interested in. You just never know where one conversation is going to take you. So don't place any limits on yourself. Don't let the fear get in the way. Just keep going. It doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks. What matters is that you're happy and you feel like you're fulfilling your heart's desire. Hope what I sense. hear you, yes, what I hear <laughs> you saying is just be your authentic self mm -hmm. without judgments, without limits, and without fear. Just be the best version of you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, a fantastic way to wrap up our conversation. It's been such a pleasure. I want people to find you. So how can people find you, Mick? Thank you, Susan. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. I've even started Instagram at the urging of my kids. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm on Instagram. <laughs> Those would be the three major ways. So if you message me, I would be happy to connect with any of your viewers. I look forward to learning more about the community of people that follow what you're doing and your amazing work. And so again, I'm really grateful for the time. This is really nice. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And are they finding you under uh, Michalina de mm -hmm. Sibio? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mick, for your, your time, for your insights. And uh, to our audience, until next time, we will continue the conversation.